The heart is a muscular organ that pumps blood throughout the body. It's found in the middle mediastinum, wrapped in a two-layered serous sac called the pericardium. It composed of four chamber, two atriums, and two ventricles. It has four valve, which is tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, and aortic valve. The heart receives its own supply of blood from the coronary arteries, which is the first branch of the aorta, that arise from ascending aorta immediately above aortic valve. The left main coronary artery, which is larger, divides into the left anterior descending artery and left circumflex artery. The right coronary artery runs in the right atrioventricular groove, which supplies the sinoatrial node in about 60% of individuals and the atrioventricular node in about 90%. So that proximal occlusion of the right coronary artery often results in sinus bradycardia and may also cause atrioventricular nodal block. Collateral circulation is a network of tiny blood vessels. When the coronary artery is narrow to the point that blood flow to the heart muscles is limited, collateral vessels may enlarge and become active. This allows blood to flow around the blocked artery to another artery nearby. A heart attack or myocardial infarction is permanent damage to the heart muscle secondary to prolonged lack of oxygen supply, ischemia, which is most often caused by plaque rupture with thrombus formation in an epicardial coronary artery, resulting in an acute reduction of blood supply to a portion of the myocardium. The blood clot typically forms inside a coronary artery that already has been narrowed by atherosclerosis, a condition in which fatty deposits plaque build up along the inside walls of the blood vessels. The left anterior descending artery is the most commonly occluded of the coronary arteries. MI may pass unrecognized, painless or silent MI is particularly common in older patients or those with diabetes mellitus, but often there is prolonged cardiac pain which is described as a tightness and heaviness in characteristics. Several key characteristics help to distinguish cardiac pain from that of other causes, for example, the site of cardiac pain is typically located in the center of the chest and it may radiate to the neck, jaw, and upper or even lower arms. And occasionally, cardiac pain may be experienced only at the size of radiation or in the back. And patients often emphasize that it is a discomfort rather than a pain. They typically use characteristic hand gesture, for example, open hand or clenched fist when describing ischemic pain. The pain of MI may be preceded by a period of stable or unstable angina, but may occur de novo. Breathlessness is often a prominent and occasionally the dominant feature of MI. If syncope occurs, it's usually due to an arrhythmia or profound hypotension. Vomiting and sinus bradycardia are often due to vagal stimulation, and are particularly common in patients with inferior MI. Sudden death In physical signs, there may be signs of sympathetic activation like pallor, sweating, tachycardia, signs of vagal activation, bradycardia and vomiting, signs of impaired myocardial function, hypotension, oliguria and call peripheries. And in auscultation, there may be third heart sound, which is called gallo. Lung crepitations may indicate pulmonary edema or fluid in the alveoli due to the heart failure. This all according to the site that affected. And the risk factors include age, men age 45 or older, and women age 55 or older, tobacco, high blood pressure, and cholesterol or triglyceride levels. Complications of myocardial infarction usually occurring within 24 hours, like cardiogenic shock, acute heart failure, electrical complications such as ventricular arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, pericarditis, 
Mechanical complications such as left ventricular septal rupture, mitral regurgitation. Most complications present less than 24 hours after an acute myocardial infarction, but mechanical complications may occur any time in the first week after an acute MI. Patients presenting with symptoms consistent with an acute coronary syndrome, including MI, require urgent evaluation. A 12-lead ECG is mandatory and is the most useful method of initial triage. The initial ECG may be normal or non-diagnostic in one-third of cases. Repeated ECGs are important, especially where the diagnosis is uncertain or the patient has recurrent or persistent symptoms. The earliest ECG change is usually ST segment deviation, depression or elevation. With proximal complete occlusion of a major coronary artery that may cause transmural MI, there is a serious evaluation of ECG chains, including acute ST elevation, progressive loss of the R wave, developing T wave, resolution of the ST elevation and terminal T wave inversion, deep Q wave and T wave inversion, and in old or established infarct pattern, the Q wave tends to persist but the T wave changes become less marked. The rate of evolution is very variable but, in general, the first one appears within minutes, second within hours, third within days, and stage 4 after several weeks or months. In non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome, there is complete occlusion of a minor vessel, causing partial thickness, subendocardial MI. This is usually associated with ST segment depression and T wave changes. The ECG changes are best seen in the leads that face the ischemic or infarcted area. And second investigation is plasma cardiac markers. These biochemical markers are creatine kinase CK, a more sensitive and cardiospecific isoform of this enzyme. CKMB and the cardiospecific proteins troponins T and I. CK starts to rise at 4 to 6 hours, peaks at about 12 hours, and falls to normal within 48 to 72 hours. The most sensitive markers of myocardial cell damage are the cardiac troponins T and I, which are released within 4 to 6 hours and remain elevated for up to 2 weeks. In the first 12 hours, patients should be admitted urgently to hospital. Adequate analgesia in opiate type is essential not only to relieve distress, but also to lower adrenergic drive and thereby reduce vascular resistance, blood pressure, infarct size, and susceptibility to ventricular arrhythmias. Antithrombotic therapy like antiplatelet, aspirin, and clopidogrel. Anticoagulants like heparin that reduces the risk of thromboembolic complications and prevent reinfarction in the absence of reperfusion therapy. Antianginal therapy like sublingual glycerol trinitrate. Immediate emergency reperfusion therapy has no demonstrable benefit in patients with non-ST segment elevation MI. Selected medium to high-risk patients do benefit from in-hospital coronary angiography and coronary revascularization, but this doesn't need to take place in the first 12 hours. In ST segment elevation MI, immediate reperfusion therapy restores coronary artery patency, preserves left ventricular function, and improves survival. Primary percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, is the treatment of choice for ST segment elevation MI, and the outcomes are best when it's used in combination with glycoprotein 2B3A receptor antagonists.